Okay, so we're kindly joined by um, Rachel Cooper um, for this CFG webinar. I'm Richard Tegg, I'm policy manager here at CFG, um, a, a trusted trainer and qualified accountant to go through some of the, the very basics here on gift aid. So um, we've had um, our members asking about not only the kind of more policy side, so some of the changes to regulation which happen, but the real basics for organisations that are just first starting out around registration, what to look out for in declarations, um, and actually signing up through the process. So Rachel's going to kindly talk us through that process and I'll be question, asking questions uh, along the way. So without further ado, I'll pass on to Rachel. Rachel, take Thank it you. away. Thank you very much indeed. Right, let's have a look at the agenda, which will be an interesting surprise for you. So we're going to look at registering for gift aid, as Bishop says, a bit about making a claim, have a look, work through gift aid declarations, and then a little bit about some errors to avoid. So, uh, where should we start? Registering for gift aid. Um, I always love the bits about registration where it talks about you can only claim back gift aid. Makes sense about being based in the UK, even the EU. I'm always a bit worried about how many people there are hiding away in Liechtenstein. Um, but uh, established for charitable purposes only, all of these different bits and pieces. Um, the bit about registered with the Charity Commission is that there may be some of you out there who are working for very small or working with very small organisations. I used to be part of a PTA that had a turnover of less than 5,000 and so we weren't registered with the Charity Commission. But because we were established for charitable purposes, then we were able to be recognised by HMRC and so we registered with HMRC and we could claim back gift aid. Or there may be, you may be exempted charities or accepted charities. So, so you don't absolutely have to be registered with the Charity Commission in order to be able to claim gift aid. The key thing is being recognised by HMRC. The key definitions around fit and proper persons as well. So, great. I know, it is great. I'm not sure whether I am one. Um, the other thing that I always say, the thing about the gov.uk information is it is really good information there is an enormous amount of it. Yeah. It's like a rabbit warren. And so uh, I would always, I would bar bookmark that because you'll probably always want to come back to the very basics about you know, how to claim and, and you can go out from there in whichever direction you like. So that's a good one to bookmark. Um, and the, the HMRC Charities Helpline is a good one as well. We all know the reputation of HMRC helplines and that you can sit there waiting to speak to the tax office for an hour. I felt a bit peeved that I waited for 13 minutes yesterday. Mm -hmm. I did time it because in the past it's only been five minutes. But the um, Charities Helpline are very proud of the fact that they are the only people in HMRC who give money away. They like giving money away and they are really helpful, always really helpful because they want you to get your gift aid right. They want you to get what you are, what you deserve. So uh, those are just two useful things, I think. Good. So when you are registering for gift aid, this is basically guidance for organisations who are at the very beginning of the path. And it is quite confusing because there are sort of lots of different stages that seem as though they're the same thing, but they're not. You have to go through four different processes or four different stages, I think. So First of all, you have to get recognition from a charity from HMRC. You then have to, you also have to register your charity with HMRC online services. You then have to enrol your charity with Charities Online, which is a part of the HMRC online services. And you then have to activate that. So having said, I want to be part of Charities Online, you then have to activate that. So we'll have a look at those because they sort of happen, some of them happen together but you have to do each of those bits. And quite often people think that they've enrolled for charities mm. online because they've got the government gateway yeah. number. So, does that make sense? Uh, so, uh, where do you start? Getting recognition from HMRC is a good place to start, I think. Um, so let's follow this link down at the bottom, charity recognition. Just have a little bit of a thing with my mouse. Um, so this is where you start. And it talks about registering your charity's details and it tells you all the different things that you're going to need. Now, HMRC still seem to remember all of this. So here's got 
form CHB1, if you're already registered and want to change your details. They remember all of the names of all of the old forms. When I was talking to them yesterday, they said, ah, oh, yes, this is CHA1. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what you have to fill in. And it tells you all the different details that you're going to need. It talks about bank account details. And if you're just starting out and you haven't got any bank statements and you haven't got any financial accounts, then they will understand that. If you've got a, if you're trying to open a bank account uh, or you open a bank account and you've got a welcome statement from your bank, something like that, a letter, uh, that's perfectly acceptable to them. But you do have to have some kind of an existence. I think they want you to have some kind of an existence like that, financial existence, because they're going to, if you're going to claim gift day, they're going to need to have a bank account for you to pay, pay it into. Uh, you do need to have dates of birth. It's, you know, it, it's telling you all of this because when you do sit down to do this rather fascinating form and fill it all in, it's good to have all of those bits of information just waiting there because they'll ask you specific questions. And on the way through, you set up your stage two, you set up your government gateway user ID, which is setting yourself up for HMRC online services. So let's press this start now button so that you can start the process of registering your charity's details with HMRC. So that's just beginning the process. So checking whether you are eligible, are you established for charitable purposes only? We've talked about this, we're saying yes. We're saying yes, you have got a bankable society account, that you are based somewhere that's eligible, and so then, either if you haven't got a government gateway user ID, so when I did this yesterday, I didn't have one when I was starting out for one of the organisations I work with. And so I went to create sign in details. Um, I am going to do this and you send your email address and then all kinds of other bits and pieces. I suspect if I go backwards, it'll get very cross with me. Oh, no, it won't. Good. Um, but I then created my it, it, having sent them my email address and the following through those instructions. It sent me this 12 digit government gateway user ID and I made up a password. It tells you helpfully that your password shouldn't be password. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that. Um, and so now you sign in and, and start the process. I would say that it will take you half an hour. If you're very good at forms, it may take you less, but it'll take you half an hour or so. So sit yourself down with a cup of tea and no interruptions. I don't know when you last had half an hour with no interruptions. <laughs> uh, but uh, just to go through with, you know, phone numbers and all of that kind of stuff. And so, so, so on that point, it might be useful to do it with, with someone as well, as Absolutely. mentioned. And perhaps someone who's, um, if you're the treasurer or someone who's associated with the charity, someone else who is as well to double check this information and just confirm to yourself that all this is correct and fine. Yep. No, that's a really good idea. And, and, um, Let's just go back to this because when it talks about the officials' details, then you need two. Um, oh, I can't remember what the precise terms are at this precise moment, but you need two responsible people and two practical people, mm. essentially, or two or three responsible people. And so practical people engaged in the day to day working of the charity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and so, when you're filling in all of those, then just thinking about who the best person is mm -hmm. to be the person who interacts with HMRC. So in different places, um, you know, a, a treasurer who's not very far away. Mm -hmm. If it's a small organisation, then somebody who who is available to to download yeah, stuff from the bank, to, right. to deal with all of this stuff, to collect together the gift aid forms and, and do all of those things. Um, but it has to be somebody who's senior enough for you to trust them with all of the with yeah. your life secrets and that's the other reason why it's quite useful to have somebody else there because if you're reading out somebody's national insurance number details and all that kind of stuff making sure you get all the right numbers in there so um i think that's it yeah you're kind of, that. that's your first stage that's getting you your recognition from hmrc and um giving you your government gateway and so when you've done this i think this then they will send you confirmation They'll give you a number. Apparently, it's a CTY1. I didn't know that, but there we go. But they'll give you a reference number, which is five digits, um, may start with a letter, and a unique code to log in online. So that unique code, they call it, sometimes they call it a, your customer number. Sometimes they call it your 10-digit something, a customer account number. But that's different from your government gateway. Government Gateway is 12 digits, this is 10 digits. So 
take note of all of these. So they will send you that. Just to confirm, you mentioned yes. here it'll take, uh, if we go back one step, it'll take two to three weeks uh, from when you send the details. For whatever reason, I suppose it, it's taking a, a bit longer. Uh, is there a set time by which it must be sent by? And, and when's a good time to start chasing HMRC in case you receive that information? The two to three weeks is, um, last time they've, they've speeded up, last time I rang them, then it was six to seven weeks. Right, but they're right. catching up with uh, the, their backlog, evidently. And so, and so if they haven't done it within two or three, there's no set time. They don't have a service level agreement yeah. on this one. Yeah. And so uh, that's how much how much time it takes. So for, if for whatever reason so, it is above three weeks, don't panic too much, but by all means check uh, after a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Absolutely, that's good. completely the right thing to do. Um, so then they've sent you your confirmation, they send you your reference number and your 10 digit code. And armed with that and your government gateway, uh, ID and the password you created. I mean, look, I actually wrote a really unhelpful page. I thought I just had that <laughs> in my head. Um, you armed with all of that information, you go back and you log in. Let's go and do it and see what it says. Oh, turn on the mouse. So you log in. And this is why it's an unhelpful page, because what you want to do is you want to register for Charities Online. And this just looks like a business tag. Yeah, it's kind of, like you've got to one page, page almost. Yeah, exactly. Horrible. Um, or perhaps you're not people who are thrown by tax pages. Mm. And so you either, you know, again, helpefully, you can either press this one. In fact, I won't give you the alternatives. <laughs> you can guess which the alternative is. but. What you're wanting to do is to add a tax to your account because you're wanting to add gift aid to your account. But then having done that, uh oh, gift aid isn't there. So you go to other taxes or schemes and continue. And there finally, after three screens, you get to what you want to, which is gift aid. And then because it's a small screen, I still have to scroll down to continue. And now you know that you've got your HMRC charities reference. And then you enter the things that you want. So your HMRC charities reference, that 10 digit number that I talked about, and you put in your postcode and off you go and you request the access. So you've, we've done, you've got your HMRC code and now you've got your access to HMRC online and now you're requesting access or you're enrolling in charities online. And that, this one, there is supposed to be a service level agreement. Mm -hmm. Having requested that access, you should get an activation code within seven days and you have to use it within 28 days. Mm -hmm. um, and having done all of that, you should then be set up and ready to go on Great. Gift Aid. Is yeah. that all right? That sounds really good. That's I think that is. So let's look at making Gift Aid claim online. Our next bit. Um, and so what we're actually, we're, there are three different ways that you can do it. You can do it by post using the form CO1. I'm not going to do that because no. I think people, I'm just not going to do that. You can use it doing downloading a spreadsheet for your donations and that's what we are going to look at. You can also do it using eligible software. If you've got eligible software, make the software supplier tell you all about it. Make them earn their money. That's what <laughs> I say. Um, I've just put something on this slide about the time limits. It's four years. If it's company, it's end of accounting period. If it's a trust or an unincorporated association, it's um, four years after the end of the tax year. That's, so but that's your sort of time limit. That's why it um, says on gift aid declarations things about previous four years, because then you can go back and you can reclaim old donations. Um, and you download a spreadsheet. There's a new guide. It's relatively new. came out last September. Um, I say it's new because I only found it this week. Because uh, you update yourself on lots of things. And so there's an interesting new guide on gift aid. Again, part of what this presentation is doing is just kind of bookmarking different things for you. And you might find that having arrived at this guide, it's all you need and you don't need mm. any of the other pointers. Or you might find that this doesn't tell you what you want and that you prefer finding your own way around. But I just thought that these are, I picked out some of the things that I think are quite useful. Um, 
And so it tells you some useful things about using the right software. And so if you are going to download the spreadsheet, it has to be in Microsoft Excel 2010 or later or LibreOffice 3.5 or later. I'm not an expert with LibreOffice. My parents use it and it irritates me um, that they do, sorry. Uh, but I'm not an expert in it. Uh, but if you've downloaded it, but you can't convert, having having downloaded one or the other, you can't convert it. Yeah. You have to save it in open document format as an ODS, dot ODS. Or an OPF, if it, ODF rather, if it's a, uh, I think a Libra. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. See, said I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and, but I mean, the thing about Libra is that it is free, and that's yeah. why it's great. Yeah. And so they also give you a link so that you can download LibreOffice if you um, don't have a spreadsheet that you can do it on. So it's, you know, and I, that's great of HMRC. Yeah, Again, enabling absolutely. people, enabling people to be able to do things. Um, and so then you go and download the schedule. I'm not sure I'm going to download it from here. I can't remember why, but we didn't do it. Um, it tells you useful things about saving it that you must always save it as a .ods. Um, and it might tell you, so when I was saving my, one of the ones I was doing yesterday, uh, it, it says, oh, it won't be, able to, won't be able to do all the things you want it to do, because it's not an XLS X. Ignore all of that, just save it as an ODS, courage your convictions. Um, and this has got useful guidance because it's got sort of, you know, um, has it got? But it's got good little um, shots of um, the spreadsheet and examples, and all that kind of stuff. So it says, I think it is a nice piece of guidance for you because um, I quite like to go away and listen and look at things. Mm. Uh, not listen, go away and look at things and read things. I'm a, a visual learner. I learn through reading. Um, so that's all of that. And so we're going to go back to this presentation and we're actually going to look at this schedule. This is what the schedule says. I've done this presentation in rooms of people where you can't actually go through the spreadsheet in detail, which is why this thing says, read this, <laughs> because the schedule, find it. The schedule, which we are going to go and download in a minute, um, has got really good guidance itself. So here's another piece of guidance about about downloading the spreadsheet and all of that kind of stuff. And it tells you useful things about what to include. But let's go and download the schedule spreadsheet and open it up and see what it looks like. So you go to this yet another page. And I'm going to do the Excel one because I've said I don't know about the other one. And I'm just going to do the gift aid donations schedule. You'll see they also give you access to community buildings and they talk about connected charities. I'm not talking about connected charities at all today. But she's also know that if people are looking for that information, it is all on this page. They can just link through back to that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we'll just look at gift aid donations and we will have a look at this spreadsheet, which I think is, I like a spreadsheet that tells you what it's doing because, mm. you know, how many times at work has someone sent you a spreadsheet and said, can you just fill it in? And you think, well, hang on, what's that to go in this box? Can't remember. Yeah. So it tells you very clearly not to change the layout. So you may think it's an ugly layout, but tough. <laughs> uh, you, you may think this is a horrid name, but you're not allowed to change that either. Uh, you have to keep the name of the tab the same. I think part of the reason for that is that there are a number of formulas in the spreadsheet which you'll come on to, and so yes. it's not to, to to change that, and it thinks you're altering that. So, yeah. Yes, and obviously it, you know, it obviously gets read by some massive system somewhere, mm. so it all has to just go in. Yeah. Um, and it tells you all the helpful things, and it also has example. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. laptop. I'm not quite used to. It has examples of how you should fill things in here as well. So that's really helpful. So uh, put people's titles in. Um, and they do like you to put people's titles in, which some people are funny about. Um, first name or initial, it says first name or initial. But yeah, there's, there's a, based on conversations with HMRC, they're, they're um, increasingly keen that people do include a, a full first name. 
Uh, as I understand, they're not going to reject claims which include the initial, but I think understandably they want to try and ensure that the correct person, you know, they're designating the right person. Of course, it can be the case that households have multiple people with the same initial, and so it wouldn't um, signify them uniquely. And so although there's no strict requirement, HMRC are very keen that uh, where possible charities do that. Um, and I think in, in essence, it's to, charities are going to sh have to show goodwill that they're trying to do it rather than there'd be a change in regulation, which means they, they would actually need to. So where possible, do include the first name. Yep, that makes sense. Um, and uh, they've got this lovely person, Professor Henry House Martin. I can imagine what it's like. Um, and so what they're pointing out here is that if you've got a double barreled name or it's the same with the first name, if you've got somebody called Anne-Marie or something like that, don't use hyphens, please. Just have the space in between the two names. I'm not quite sure. You know, again, it's about machine reading, mm. I guess. Um, house number, postcode. Uh, helpfully, they've pointed out if you've got somebody who's giving money from overseas where there isn't a postcode, you just put X in there. Uh, and we'll come on to sorry we'll come on to aggregated donations and sponsored events in a minute. Uh, donation date because uh, you need to have the donation date because uh, when they're linking up to these individuals because they're linking up to the individual's tax records to make because that's what it's all about and so they need to link up to tax years and all that kind of stuff so they need to know about what the donation date is if. Professor Henry House Martin had given, because this total is £240, if he'd given 12 donations of £20 each over the period of a year, then the donation date starting on the 24th of April, bing, 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 then the donation date is the, um, the date of the last donation. So if you have a number of donations from the same person, then you put in the donation date of the last donation. I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. um, then the the other um, thing that people right, right so there are two other things that it's worth drawing your attention to. One of them is aggregated donations, um, which is something that HMRC have put in to make life simpler for people, and yet people get yeah. confused. Not by that. explained. Um, and I think it is quite well explained, mm. really. But people don't people get confused by it, and so the idea here is that if you've got a number of gift aided donations that are less than twenty pounds, you can um, you can just add them all together and, and put them in as one line on your gift aid form, um, which can be useful. So, so if you have, I don't know, say you have a, a, a an event where lots of people are giving you gift aided donations. But you're not likely to see them all again, and lots of them give you gift aid donations for less than twenty pounds. You need to keep records of all of their gift aid donations. You need to of, of their declarations of their all of these details because they are proper gift aid donations. But having to fill in all of those details will take up a lot of lines. You're only allowed a thousand lines on this form, um, and it's just a sort of palaver, cutting and pasting all of mm. those names and addresses. And so as long as if somebody came into, if HMRC came in to audit you, you would be able to present them with a list. So in this example, it's £880 that are in one-off gift aid donations. Yeah. And as long as you would be able to present them with a list that would be able to give the names, address and postcode of each of these people that made up that £880, then you only have to put it in as a single line. Is that reasonably explained? Yeah, yeah, pretty well. Okay. You're very polite. <laughs> um, so that's that about aggregated donations. And it's a similar admin saving thing with sponsored events. So if you've got a sponsor form, then you what you put into the form is the participant in the sponsored activity and the date that the money was collected. So the date that, the, yes, the date that the money was collected. Unless, as it points out here, if there are any donations, if you're lucky enough to have any sponsorship donations that are over £500, then you have to separate those out. Um, and I think, I think those are the kind of key things that people... 
Yeah, no, actually, I mean, there's one, one point to touch on around the gift aid small donation scheme, of Absolutely, course, that the, yeah. um, uh, perhaps unhelpfully, the spreadsheet that um, the schedule that HMRC provide is, is identical. But of course, you wouldn't have a lot of this information for it. Now, the temptation is just to put the gift aid small donation scheme information into this spreadsheet, which would be, in fact, incorrect. You need a separate spreadsheet with all that information in. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, yes. So you would. You'd do your gift aid spreadsheet, and then if you had your gift aid small donations, you'd download another version of the same spreadsheet, and you'd put your lines for your gift aid small donation scheme in the same spreadsheet, and enter that up as a separate claim. Okay, so I think that that is the stuff on the schedule. Mm. Oh yes, but now we have to talk about submitting it. That's right. And so. Uh, no, I've got moved on to my notes. So, um, what you do is you um, go back to the uh, presentation. Let's get back to the presentation, and actually go back one in the presentation because it is in here. Claim gift aid online. But and again, there's another start now button. I quite like the start now button. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I can't do it. We did this last time, actually. Yeah. I can't do it because I don't have it. But you, so you just start now, and somewhere on here in your business taxes, it it will say that you can claim charity tax or claim. This is of course after you've gone through the process of registering for it. We've already mentioned, we yeah, about, yes. and waiting that period of time. And so you click in through there. Um, there is a, a organisation called. Um, parish resources that have been through and have done some quite good screenshots of Great. what all the different forms are. So you can look up parish resources. We'll provide a link to that in the uh, comments of this video as well. It's a bit cheeky, but there we go. Because um, I haven't been able to go through that. Uh, because it, it, the reason why I didn't use it is because it may be slightly different now because theirs are from 2016 and things change. Yeah. And I haven't done a gift aid claim in the last six months. So I sort of slightly doubt about putting any screenshots up. Um, uh, and so the, that green button takes you to the login and it do you say that you want to make this charity re repayment claim. And then it and then it takes you through a series of questions and it asks you what it is that you want to claim. So it says, do you want to make a gift aid claim or do you want to make a um, uh, gift aid small donation scheme claim or do you want to make another kind of claim? I would suggest that until you've built up your confidence at making the claims, perhaps make one claim at a time because it's, I, you know, small mistakes. Just, mm. make, just make a mistake with one at a time and then that's good. Um, it then asks you some more details about the organisation again. I, it's, you know, it's, uh, the guidance that I showed you earlier just says follow the online instructions, which I as though that's the simplest thing in the world, and it's not the simplest thing in the world. It, but just follow the online instructions and it'll tell you stuff. It asks about the organisation again, and then it asks if you are a corporate trustee, which is a slightly difficult question, um, if you haven't come across that terminology before, because it sort of sounds as though it's asking you whether you're a trustee of a company, but it's not. A corporate trustee is a technical thing where a company itself is a trustee of a charity. And so unless you are, representing a company as a trustee of the charity. If you're an individual filling this in as a trustee, then just say no to corporate trustee. I probably didn't need to tell you that. Sorry about that. Um, anything else on that? No. Yeah, um, but again, my tip, if in doubt, sit down with a company and a friend. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you press submit, obviously you have to re-input your details and your password. So off you go. And um, and then you should get the money within four weeks or so and keep an eye on your bank account and see whether it's turned up. Sometimes it comes quicker. I've got a, you know clients who the money comes in much quicker. If it hasn't turned up, give them a shout because you know you never know whether the submit button hasn't quite, I mean, they'll send mm. you things, but you're never quite sure. So if it hasn't come, do chase them because as I say, they're nice and they like talking to you. <laughs> they like to know that they're giving money out. So that's my thing about claims. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Really useful. Right, declarations, um, and you know, if something is going to be a gift rather than an ordinary donation, 
not only do you as an organization have to fulfill all of these different things, but the person who's giving it has to have said they want it to be a gift. Again, there's another link. It's now got to a stage where I've done so many links that I'm thinking, right, which one's this? What does this one say? It's very exciting. Um, and it is, this is, I think this is a useful link again, because it gives you lots of information about what needs to be in, in declarations, what records you need to keep, joint declarations, declarations for more than one charity, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, they provide you, HMRC provide you with a model declaration. They provide it as though you were going to put it on paper, because it looks like this. Um, but HMRC fully understand that we're now in the 21st century and that people give in a number of different ways. And so the guidance tells you very clearly what it is that you need to tell people, mm. what, what information it is that they need to have on the form. So, as you said, the donor has to agree to the day being claimed. I put a little tick here. I noticed somewhere that uh, there's been a ruling that a cross in a box that asks for a tick is as valid as a tick in a box. And um, I think that you said before, Richard, that you know if, that that this is a moving, moving, yeah. moving feast. Uh, absolutely, and, and in a sense, no one's um, the kind of arbiter and expert on this. And if you've got a question about this, please do either let HMRC know or CFG, and we can help with that. Yes, because they're, because. HMRC want people to get it right, um, and they do want people, they want charities to get what they deserve. Um, and so and so they want to go with the with the donor's intentions as long as the donor is honourable. Yeah. And so, you know, it is obvious if a donor has put a cross in a box instead of a tick in a box. Well, I suppose it's not. They might be saying, no, I don't want it to be, but then why would they fill in a piece of paper and hand it to you yeah, saying, with their name, no, exactly. so then no, I yeah, don't want it. And I it. think that was the, the reason given that, of course, it, well, as soon as they start to fill in, then I think it's, it's, it's clear that their intentions are. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's the key paragraph in the middle about the donor being a taxpayer and uh, because gift aid comes out of the tax that they pay and that if they pay less income tax or capital gains tax than the amount of gift aid claimed, that it's their responsibility. Yeah, it's crucial. And that is crucial. And that's, I now realise my age when I start saying things like, well, that's quite new, because I think it's five years old now or something. <laughs> yeah. That this is absolute, and like, it can be more, oh dear. Um, so it's not your responsibility. You, they must make that statement. And on some level, unless you're completely clear that they're, just being appalling um, you know you have to take people on trust if they've made that statement then that's true and it's not your responsibility then to re repay yeah. any tax that you've reclaimed on the gift aid because that's what the statement says and i think that's a good thing that mm. hmrc are making Absolutely. people say that um again we have the donor's name thing and we've talked about the although it says first name or initials the the desire for first name for kind of the as much clarity as possible. Mm. Um, they talk in their guidance about joint declaration. I suspect that they're clearer on it than I am, but I'm still going to do my <laughs> mum and dad example. Um, so if you have uh, a person, so in my household, my dad is the one whose pensions amount to sufficient for him to be paying tax. And my mum is the one who is the one who organises all the money and signs all the checks and all of that kind of stuff, because they still operate on checks. Um, and what HMRC have said is in that kind of situation where there is a joint account and the money comes out of the joint account, even if it is, so my dad has made a declaration to pay money to a charity, but it's my mum who has actually signed the cheque. Even in that situation, as long as it's on a joint account, then they will assume that the money is coming from my dad under that gift aid declaration, the charity can reclaim their gift aid. Great. Great. Uh, there's also stuff, you know, you will have seen when you've made donations that in certain circumstances, then people have put um, additional belt and braces things to make sure that it is absolutely a gift, that it's not a bucket to collect from a bucket collection, that people haven't got anything in return for it. Um, and at this, I'm donating my own money. It's not the proceeds from sales of goods or from the sale of tickets. Um, and I don't, don't, don't get anything in return. In general, for normal gift aid donations, that's what you want. Sometimes with online donations, then it's easier for people to get 
tick those boxes. So, you know, they're getting keener for people to add that, but you don't have to. Um, that's just a sponsor. We might have a quick look at the sponsor form. Again, they give you, uh, this is more just to show you that they give you guidance on what statements you should put in a sponsor form. So that's really helpful as well. Um, I think we might have a quick look, go back and have a quick look at the um, the guidance. Um, where they're talking about what records you need to keep. Um, because you do have to keep records of all gift aid declarations, whether they're written online or verbal. So yes, as I said, HMRC, no, it's the 21st century, so not everybody writes in copper plate ink on uh, big bits of paper. And so the idea is that you must be able to prove that the person has made the declaration. And so I would suggest that you think about whether you would accept it as reasonable ev evidence if someone explained it to you. So, so, <clears throat> sorry, dry throat now. Um, talking about verbal declarations, keeping an audio recording, that's pretty good. Uh, but not, oddly enough, a member of your staff taking it down as a dictation because that comes from a member of staff, it doesn't come from a donor, so that's a bit weird. Um, but if you write a letter, if somebody gives you a verbal declaration and you write a letter to them, then that is seen as reasonable evidence yeah. that the person has made a declaration. Um, you can keep scans. They don't, HMRC don't expect you to keep paper copies of everything. They understand how small people's offices are, or indeed that a lot of organisations don't have offices. So they, you know, they will expect you to scan things, store things electronically, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll come on to more bits about, I've got, I've, from somewhere else I've downloaded stuff about mm -hmm. all those other records. Okay. You never know where. Keep record of cancelled declarations and keep everything for six years. For a long time. That's a really long time. Um, so let's go back to this. Um, written that we've covered quite a lot of these. Um, emails, <coughs> copy of a mobile phone, text message, all of those kinds of things. Confirmation that they've been sent, written, written record. Any other comments on any of those, Richard, in your experience or questions that you've... Yeah, had? I mean, I think, I think the key thing you, you've touched upon, and we'll, we'll come on to uh, a little bit later, is uh, yeah. you, would you consider it reasonable if someone else were to provide that to you? So I think all these yeah. are certainly sufficient, but I, I just echo that. It's, it's an important thing to make sure that you've got those. I mean, what one you've touched on there is it about uh, mobile phones and people's text messaging, confirmation declaration. It's important that if whatever reason people can donate by text to the organisation, that if you want to gift aid that claim, that you then have to then go back and forth with a, with a declaration by, by text as well. Yes, yeah. yes, because you've got to have all of those details because HMRC needs to make sure that they have really paid the tax. Yeah, all that's that right. Kind of stuff. So, so I think that's it for declarations. That's right. So let's go to common errors that you should avoid, <laughs> yeah. which are, well, it's not that exciting, let's face it. <laughs> it's yeah. just, so uh, the, there's an organisation called Charity Tax Group that CFG has worked very closely with. Um, and in March 2019, they got together with HMRC officials to talk about it and to see, um, they discussed data issues relating to gift aid. Um, the nice thing was that the HMRC officials, and see if I can actually read this out, uh, said that they are always striving to maximise charities' eligible revenue through gift aid, taking a sensible approach where guidance may not be clear to charities. I suspect that didn't just come out in casual conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that was a pretty a comms officer affair. But, but it is true from meetings with HMRC officials when I first started at CFG, that one of the, the key things they, they refer to is a piece of research done by Quadrangle on, on their behalf several years ago, which looked at the amount of unclaimed gift aid um, and the amount that was incorrectly claimed. Now, the amount of unclaimed gift aid that could be claimed by charities is over half a billion pounds. It's roughly 560 million pounds per year. Whereas the amount that's incorrectly claimed that shouldn't be is about 180 million. And so the key message we keep getting from HMRC, they want both those numbers to be zero, which of course will mean a net benefit to charities. And part of the reason we're putting on Gift Aid Awareness Day, we do many of our trainings, is there's a lot of money which charities could be claiming, could be gift aiding, which they're not. And so it's really important that they do. Yes, exactly that. And also, I, you know, the the incorrectly claimed, they're not suggesting that the money shouldn't be being claimed. 
but that they're wasting their time, yeah. everybody's time, with these errors. So yeah. they, yeah. I don't know what that year was. <laughs> I'll just move on. So, um, you know, some of them are really simple, like uh, missing out donation dates. I banged on about donation dates earlier. So on your gift aid form, make sure that you have a donation date in there. Um, we've also talked about the number of different numbers that you need to keep a hold on. Uh, and so people need to remember that there is often confusion between the charity registration number and the HMRC reference number. None of this is surprising, but just kind of. Um, and then another thing that happens is that as staff move on, one of the details that sometimes gets forgotten is to change over the details on HMRC. Mm. And so then claims are put in by the new person in post and that person isn't properly authorised by HMRC. And so then the claim can't go through. Um, and yes, because you put in your own details when you're making the claim. Mm. And so if you have, a, if, you're, if your details don't match what HMRC have got, then you're in trouble. Uh, the other thing that happens is that also you might find if somebody's moved on and you haven't changed all the HMRC details. I've worked with organisations where, you know, HMRC for security will send a text to the contact person that they've got. And if that contact person has disappeared, it may be some time before you can get all of those details. Make sure back you stay on good tabs with them as well. Yes. Otherwise, you a bit of difficulty. Yes. yes. Um, we did talk about gift aid small donations claims and the need to separate them from the gift aid claims. And that's something that does come up quite a lot. Mm. Um, and we talked also about aggregated donations and the confusions that people have. And I think, I have to say, I think that HMRC brought it on themselves by calling the gift aid small donation scheme the gift aid small donation scheme because it's a top up scheme. It's a yeah, it's brilliant not, it's top not up a gift scheme, aid scheme really at all. but it's not yeah. gift aid. Their association with it is that they think that if you're going to be good enough to do it and have good enough systems to do it, they'll just say, if you do gift aid already, then that probably means you're good enough. To, but there's no association. And so also, they, to also benefit from the gift aid small donation scheme, you need to have signed up for gift aid. So it was a, it was a way of encouraging and yes. incentivizing that as well. So, but uh, obviously, having read all the links that I've sent you to and listened to this fascinating webinar, you're not going to get confused between those two. But if you do, then ask CFG or look up the yeah. links. And CFG has a number of trainings throughout the year, which looks at these issues, both on gift aid and related to other tax issues, such as VAT, which we're thankfully not going to touch on today. <laughs> um, but there is um, full day trainings to go through all the specifics you might have and all the questions from experts, both from our corporate partners, but also from CFG staff as well. Yeah. So I think that that wraps up our very, we haven't looked at connected charities as things that we haven't done, but there's loads of places that you can get help from. I think we've pointed out Best places to go to for help, if you're not going to ask CFG and go on the full day trainings. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that wraps up today's basic practical guide to gift aid claiming. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a really useful guide to all charities first starting out. Thanks. So thanks very much for joining us.